open to Galatians 5. And really, I'm kind of, this is Alan's message at 1030, part two, sort of. I really thought he did an excellent job of describing what it is like to be uh, walking in the, uh, the new nature, uh, walking after the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. See, Jesus is our pattern. How many, he, how many knows he's perfect? All right, he's our pattern. I mean, the mark, the standard is really high. But if you're not careful, religion will get you thinking that if you're not walking there, then you're rejected. And that's not true either. Okay? Now, we're never going to lower the standard. So let's just go ahead and say it with me. As he is, so am I in this world. I am to walk as he walked. He left me a standard. He is my pattern. And I'm following the Lord. He was perfect. I'm not. <laughs> but we're walking after him, see. And that even Paul, even at, uh, after he'd been in ministry for decades, he said, I don't count myself to have apprehended. Well, what does that mean? He didn't count himself to be perfect. He didn't count himself to be walking right up, right up to that standard. He says, no, I still I have to forget those things that are behind, and I have to press towards the mark. Amen? Well, we're all pressing towards the mark, and if I was going to try and boil down Alan's message, as long as you're pressing, as long as you're doing those things, and this is what Pastor Dave would say years ago. He'd say, look, God will walk through hell with a man or a woman with your faults while you're all messed up. God will still walk through hell with you. You can have fellowship with him, is how Alan was saying it today. As long as you don't start saying that sin is not sin when it is, and as long as you don't give up and say, okay, my war with the flesh is over. See, and a lot of people do. Really, a lot of people do. And that's really, to be honest with you, that's one of the main attractions of the radical grace message. Because the moment that you swallow that doctrine, your war with the flesh is over. You know, and it's a gospel where God's going to receive your flesh into the Holy of Holies. But he does not receive your flesh into the Holy. He is not the, even the father of your flesh. He is the father of your spirit. Now, your spirit can go right in the Holy of Holies. Your flesh, no, no, no. <laughs> All right. Now, the reason I had you turn to Galatians, we've really taught a lot in these last few years about the difference in walking in the spirit, walking in the flesh. Here, it's fasting season, so we'll... We went to Matthew chapter 9 where he talks about you don't put a new cloth onto an old garment. Why? Because those two do not agree. They cannot work together no matter how much you try. First time you, if you put a, an unshrunken brand new pair of old-fashioned cotton Levi's like we used to have that shrunk like crazy, if you patch an old garment with that, the first time you wash it, that tear is going to be made even worse. They, it's not like... Uh, it's not like they can work together with great difficulty. No, the illustration is they cannot work together. And that he was teaching about fasting. The trouble is God had to put the new wine into these old bottles. Well, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't normally do that. He had to put the new patch onto the old garment because we have to have these bodies from planet Earth in order to have authority here during this dispensation. So in order for, Jesus doesn't have a body from here anymore himself. He has a glorified body, which if we were teaching, uh, we could, there is a body that is natural, there is a body that is spiritual. His body now is spiritual. It's not of the earth. Yet he has to have authority on the earth. Well, he would have to have a body from the earth. Well, how can he have a body from the earth? Oh, Ephesians 5 says, we are bone of his bone. We are our flesh of his flesh. The church is the very body of Christ. Amen? All right, so we're teaching about fasting so that our body is more and more put in that positional place of death where God has already established it. Now, for God to, for God to decree it dead is one thing. Have you noticed for you to keep it dead is another? <laughs> Have you found out there's a little bit of a war there? <laughs> All right, so in Galatians... Uh, when we're teaching about the new agreeeth not with the old, 
then Paul really expanded it on that over in Galatians 5. We'll look at it again and then go on from there tonight. So Galatians 5, 16 starts off like this. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and that should be a little, all of these should be little S's. Walk in the new nature, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That word spirit should be little s. You could put new nature. That is the new wine. Got that? The flesh here would represent the old bottle. Now notice, the flesh lusts against the new nature. They don't agree. <laughs> the spirit, the new nature, well, it's against the flesh. They don't want the same things. Your flesh has no moral compass at all. If you'll allow me, it's a dog. <laughs> it really is. It's a dog. It's an animal. It has animal instincts, animal impulses. The unregenerate man, the only conscience he has is whatever his parents beat into him. But if he was raised in, in, the, in the wild, he'd sleep with anything that would let, let it sleep with him. And not, he wouldn't have no conscience about it at all. The flesh, that's just the way the flesh is. It wants what it wants when it wants it, and it wants your stuff if it can get it. <laughs> Isn't that right? Here, the motto of the flesh, what's mine is mine, and what's yours is mine. <laughs> Right? That's, that's the flesh. And it, 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 it wants gratification. It likes uh, highs. It likes experience. It wants all of those natural things. Doesn't care about God at all. It has no moral compass. Your spirit, on the other hand, has been born of God. It loves righteousness. It loves holiness. It loves goodness. And, well, the end of this, it loves joy. It love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, faith, meekness, temperance. That is the fruit of your spirit. That is the nature of who you really are. And that is the exact opposite of the flesh. So God did this very thing. He poured the new wine into these old bottles. They want different things. They do not agree. In the early days, I would just complain like crazy to God. Why did you leave me in this old bottle? Couldn't you just go ahead and give me the new one? And it was a long time before I understood, no, he couldn't. If he did, he might as well take me on to heaven because I would be of no use to him here at all. I would have no authority here. He couldn't do anything through me here. In order to have authority here, you have to have a body from here. Okay. So normally we focus on, uh, when we're teaching on this passage, walking according to the new nature instead of walking according to the flesh. And that is what it's teaching. But see, you've got to be careful. It's, let's back up a little farther in the chapter. Remember the first law of meditation? You don't ever lift a scripture out of its setting. It means what it means in the setting God gave it. See, there's an even more subtle danger than yielding to the flesh. And that's yielding to religion. And that's really the subject of Galatians chapter 5. Because if you back up before this, now he, everything that we've taught here is correct about the flesh and that war. And you've got to have dominion by your spirit. All of that is true. But the real danger that was going on in Galatia at the time... The Judaizers had come. And they were saying Christ is not enough. Being born again is not enough. You're going to have to also keep the law. That was the real issue. So if you back up in that very same chapter, we don't have to go back very far, just to verse 1 of chapter 5. Stand fast therewith, or excuse me, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Now at this moment, he's not talking about free from sin. He's talking about being made free from the law of Moses. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, now look up at me for a moment. That was the big issue of the day, circumcision. The Judaizer said, unless you be circumcised, you Galatian Gentile 
believers in Christ, unless you be circumcised, you'll never make heaven. You, you got to be circumcised. I told you about an email I got recently. There's a website where supposedly angels take people to hell, and they, they talk to these Christians in hell, and the Christians are saying, I, one of the things that a lot of them say, I'm in hell because I didn't tithe. Well, yeah, and people believe it by the droves. And, of course, you're well taught, and you, you, you roll your eyes when I say that. No, a lot of people believe that. They believe that. And that's no different than this. There, the issue is tithing, whereas here in the first century, the issue was circumcision. But they're both of the law. And you cannot be justified by the law of Moses. They'll go back to this morning's service. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. And one of the big issues that the writer of Hebrews was trying to get across to these Hebrew Christians because the pressure was on them, give up Jesus and go back under the law. And the writer of Hebrews is trying to tell them there is no law to go back to. It's not that God's law doesn't exist, but that covenant that he made with them coming out of Egypt, he has taken that away. That has been fulfilled. It's done. You can't go back to the law of Moses. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. It's, I, mean, I like to say it this way, it's Christ or perish. That's it. There's nothing else to go back to. So even as we teach all of the tools that we teach, you've got to be careful. The enemy is really good. If you're not, if you're not careful, let's say, you, let's say you listen to these horrible messages Gary's been teaching on fasting. You know, oh, every time I go, he's teaching on fasting. Well, let's say you take it to heart and you start fasting. And suddenly, God, you st some of your prayers start getting answered. You go, oh, ah, I'm earning stuff from God now. <laughs> you're starting to swallow religion again. No, you're not earning nothing. The only thing you're doing when you fast is you're walking as who you, he has already made you by grace. You're just growing up into him, that's all. You're not earning nothing. You got to be careful not to slip back into subtle religion and start thinking, oh, he's answering my prayer because I fast. No, he answers your prayer because you're a son. Jesus paid the price for you. Jesus made it possible for his father to become your father. Amen? Now, don't get me wrong. See, radical grace will take that little slice of truth and they'll run right off in the ditch with it. And they'll say, now, see there, it doesn't matter. You can just live any way you want to. You don't have to wrestle with your flesh anymore. All your sins have been forgiven. They say it like this, past, present, and future, and that's not true at all. If I had time tonight, which I don't have time, but we'll teach, we'll teach specifically on that. No, all of your past sins were remitted, not forgiven. They were remitted in Christ. Why were they remitted? Because they have been paid for. And the blood of Jesus is the receipt. <laughs> the blood of Jesus on the mercy seat proves your sins as a child of Adam have been paid for. Not forgiven. Paid for. That's the word remitted. Paid in full with a terrible price. Amen? Forgiveness belongs to the Christian. It belongs to the Christian because... We're the ones that the law of liberty has set us free from sin. Most of us don't know it because we weren't taught that from the, the pulpits, you know, growing up. We were taught, most of us were taught you're just an old sinner saved by grace, you know. It's, thank God you, you'll make heaven, but you can't really change. You're forgiven, but you can't really change. You're still, you know who you are. And, and you get a lot of help from that, from your, your own walk and your failings, you know. So, yeah, yeah, see, that's who I am. No, you are who God says you are. And it's like he's trying to remove this blinder, this veil from in front of our face so that we see there was a prophecy came through within the last month or so, and there was a sentence in there that just hooked me. And it goes something like this. I'm paraphrasing a little, but it went, many of you are concerned about where you should be, where you should be, where you should be. He said, I want you to look past where you think you should be to where you already are. God, man, if you ever got slapped with truth, <laughs> slap me again, Lord. Don't let me ever forget it. Slap me again, Lord. You, if you find it, Doug, I'll, I'll, I'll read it. 
Did you find it? Let me let me let me just y'all come get it done. Okay. The pressure for many. And by the way, if you want to find this, it's at it's at Dave's website under the uh, prophecies. And this one came on December twenty fourth, two thousand seventeen, day before, day before Christmas. It says the pressure for many is about should be, where you should be, and what you should be doing. None of y'all have ever you don't ever hear the devil whisper any of that in your ear, do you? Yeah, I know. What you should already be experiencing, and how much farther along you should be. Set your sights beyond where it seems you should be and see where you already are in me. We keep trying to be what he has already made us. We keep trying to become what he's already made us. We already are sons. We already are born of his spirit. We already have been baptized in the Holy Ghost. He's already given us a, the, the teacher and his word but we keep the danger is to slip back into religion trying to produce what can only be experienced in the spirit the work has already been done and everything that we do here is not trying to get God to do something everything we do is trying to walk out what he's already done for us see I'm when I'm, I'm going through this fasting thing I'm trying to be as transparent as I know how I don't like fasting still. I'll be honest with you. I worry about people that tell me they do. <laughs> Maybe they're okay. I don't know. I think they're a little cuckoo. But I am finding out, I am finding out that the fasting time really more than, well, after the first day. First day is just bad. <laughs> but the fasting, I'm finding, it's not pleasant. I've known, I don't think, I haven't, I haven't come to any pleasant places in fasting. They tell me there is such a place. I'm, I'm just going on their word. <laughs> but I am finding out the more difficult war is after the fast. It's, it's almost, not, and we can all relate. Now, while you're fasting, it's not pleasant. We can all relate with Nathan whipping his knife out that time. Remember somebody cut him off in traffic? Here's the preacher of the word, right? Whipping out his knife. <laughs> you, we, can, we can, you know, I, I say the moral of that story Never carry a knife when you're fasting. <laughs> I remember Rosalie would tell Dave when he said when he said he was going to start his second longer fast. Rosalie says, "Pat, Pat, Pat, that's that's good, Dave. Do you mind fasting somewhere else?" <laughs> now there's volumes right there, right? But even that is kind of to be expected. That's not what I'm talking about. After the fast, and I mean two or three days after, you know, and I just doing I'm just doing series fasting. Like two days, two or three days, you know. Two or three days after that, suddenly emotions, Angie, everybody, you know, people that are around me, I'm not different really away from the pulpit than I am here. I'm pretty much the same. And I really do keep a tight rein on my emotions most of the time. That wasn't always that way. I was raised by someone with a snap temper, and I had a snap temper. But I haven't manifested that in a lot of years. Like it used to be. Let's say it that way. <laughs> okay. Nobody's died in a long time. No, I'm teasing this. No. <laughs> but I'm normally, you know, and almost, almost uh, pride a little bit. I don't ask Gary how he feels. I tell Gary how he feels. Well, I got that from Smith, you know, Smith Wigglesworth. And to be honest, I've been pretty good at it. But now after doing this fasting, the other day I had a day. And I mean emotions, lack of patience, hopelessness to the left, despair to the right. I kept going. Nor the things that I normally do, which is offer up the sacrifice of praise and start counting your many blessings, count the things that I normally do that works, dug the hole deeper. <laughs> I, I couldn't seem to get out of it. And a whole day went like that, and the next day I was better, and I go, what is going on? And I, I'm not saying, I can't speak it exactly. It's not like I heard sentences from the Lord, but this is a paraphrase. It's like that emotional stability you've walked in has been the arm of flesh. And fasting is now removing what you've depended on. And now you can't 
It's not a matter of controlling it anymore. Now it's a matter of putting it to death. Does that make sense? So you know what that tells you? You've got to go back to fasting. But it's working. I can, I can tell, you know, uh, I knew on a surface level because of Dave teaching on it and others teaching on it that when you fast, um, how does that old saying, you know, why do you put the gold in the furnace? Well, it's to purify the gold. So the darkness, the blackness, the, back, the crud comes to the surface where it can be skimmed off, right? Well, I understood that when it comes to, like, why you're in the fast. But what I'm finding out, yeah, there, that's one thing. Another thing, deeper than that, where you think you're okay. <laughs> See, this makes me wonder, what else is in there? See, this is that sealing of the flesh again. What else is in there that is affecting my walk that I thought I was okay? Well, fasting, I'm finding, is a tool that removes flesh strength where I have controlled my emotions by the energy. Did you know flesh cannot cast out flesh? Flesh can't really control flesh. I mean, it can temporarily. But he's not after us controlling our flesh. My Bible says we're supposed to mortify the flesh. And that's a big difference. So I found out deep within Gary, and yes, sir, I'm going to use the phrase, uh, deep, I found out, and Gary, I'm going to do it like this. <clears throat> do, you know, do you know Gerhardt? Gerhardt is German for Gary. I, I learned this from a German man on a plane one time. He was telling everyone what their name meant in German. I said, what is Gary? He said, oh, Gary is Gerhardt. That means warrior for God. I went, yes. Yes. Warrior for God. Boy, how does Dave do that? You know, warrior for God. Well, I'm finding out that in that warrior for God, there's a little whiny baby. A little whiny flesh baby. Oh, it's hopeless. I'm never going to make it. Just look at everything that's going on. I don't, I don't think we're going to mad. I, I don't think I can pray. I don't think I can fast anymore. I'm, and besides, they don't like me anyhow. And I want to slap that guy. I'm going, who is that? I don't even like that guy. He's still in there. I didn't realize he's still in there. And he is affecting me more than I thought. And that guy's got to die. He's got to die to death on the cross, not just be controlled. I've been controlling him, apparently, with the arm of flesh somehow. I don't even know how that works. I just know what he's saying. But he's not after me to control him. He's after me to kill him. Y'all getting anything? Is this making sense? I hope it's making sense. We don't want to start the, the warning to the Galatians. Don't start going back to religion, which religion is always a type of of empowerment of the flesh. It's something you can do in the flesh to appease God or earn something from God. All right, you're in Galatians 5. We're switching vein a little bit, but not a whole lot. But going back to Alan's teaching this morning, which I thought was excellent, how you walk in the light as he is in the light. And what that means is even while you're in your faults. See, for me, this is... Uh, I'm going to go more than smoking. I'm going to go back to the very first week I got saved. Now, I was 33 years old. I'd been trained by the world really strong. That first week was the weirdest week of my life, I think. But I really got saved. I got radically saved. If you would have seen me... Now, before that week, I and the guy, we had matching new Cadillac cars. I always wore a tailored suit. My time was too valuable for me to go to the tailor's. The tailors literally came to my office and measured me to custom make me a suit. I have owned cars that now that cost less than my ties used to cost. You ever give $400 for a tie? I have. I'm, and this was back in the 70s. Okay? I'm trying to get you to understand the difference, what happened here. Uh, we lived in a nice house in the right part of town. Uh, you know, people used to 
Well, we, the, one of the reasons they would come and try and learn real estate from me is they admired our lifestyle and how we dressed and the cars we drove and the house we lived in. So I'm trying to get you to understand that's, that's Gary. But Gary was deader than a stone. I was on the inside, I was dead as a doorknob. Little old Michael Muccio comes, preach the gospel, you've heard the story, and I got saved. Now let's talk about that first week. So here we go from that guy with the suit and the cars and the house. I'm sitting there in my living room. I had an encounter with Christ. All I want to, I'm sitting there in the mornings, get up with bedhead, and I don't care. I've got on my old blue robe, some kind of house shoes on. I'm sitting there at the glass table in our dining room with my Bible, my bourbon and Coke, and my cigarettes, and I'm reading my Bible. I'm not even filled with the Holy Ghost yet. I'm just reading my Bible, not understanding hardly anything that I'm reading, and tears dripping off my chin. Religion would have judged me so bad. Said, this guy is not even saved. And I want you to know there was a love affair going on. I've never felt the master as close as I felt him that first week. He held me tight. And I didn't understand come here from Sikkim. I didn't know hardly anything except I was a sinner. And he paid the price for me and now I'm saved. And I don't even know what it means yet. I don't know. I'm starving for this. I don't even know what this. I'm just reading it in my mind. I couldn't have hardly told you anything but my spirit was receiving it somehow and tears just flow off the end of my chin just dripping just drink my bourbon and coat smoke my cigarette praise you jesus walk around in my blue robe and this is the guy that had the 400 dollar tie and the suit and the cadillac cars and the, and i didn't care about any of it anymore i just wanted to know him and you think he's going to reject me now see, if you can carry that same thinking to where you are right now, I try and carry it to where I am right now. My God, my life is so different now than it was then. It hasn't been about money in all these years. And, and good Lord, we don't, you know, haven't, I haven't had a drink since 1980. Don't go to the bars. Money has not been my God. I, you know, every thought. Do you know people used to just be like dollar bills to me in that, in that business? And if I meet a new person, I'm thinking... How much money am I going to make off of you? That was who I was. Everything was money. Everything. But that same Jesus that held me tight, loved on me that week, sipping my bourbon and coat. That was not the Shekinah glory cloud filling that room. Loving on me. That Jesus has not forsaken me now. And I'm still not walking perfect. In fact, what's funny, you, when I really compare my life now to then, man, I'm holy to the 10th power. <laughs> I mean, if you just go by the natural things, you know, dear Lord, how my life was then and how my life is now. But if anything, because I see him more clearly than I saw him then, if anything, I almost feel like I'm further away. Because there's so much distance, I, st I still see so much between where I'm walking and where I see him. But that's exactly what Paul said. He says, I don't count myself to have apprehended. I, I don't count myself to have made it. But this one thing I have to do. I have, Paul had to do it and we have to do it. This one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are past. I keep reaching ahead and pressing for the mark of the high call that is in Christ Jesus. And as long as you're pressing, that's if I, in that Alan's message, as long as you're pressing, walking close with him. I was thinking after Alan's message, you know, Peter said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him. And I knew Peter thought he was being generous. He, Peter really probably thought three times. <laughs> Till seven times? I mean, I think he thought he was being generous, you know. And the Lord says, no, I say not seven times, but 70 times seven. 
And if the Lord expects us to walk in that kind of forgiveness toward our fellow man, how much more will the Lord walk like that with you? Especially if you're pressing and walking in the light and you're walking close to Jesus. And when you miss it, you don't run from him. You don't justify it. You run right back to him. And there's 1 John 1, 9. You confess your sin. See, where you're, where you're in danger is when you say, I, I, you didn't sin, when you know you did. Now, that's when you're in trouble. See? He says, no, confess it. See, what does any parent want? Any parent. Don't lie to me, boy. My dad always told me, he said, now, if you do wrong, son, you're going to get a whooping. But if you lie to me about it, <laughs> the whooping you're going to get for the lion is going to be way worse than the whooping you did for, you get for whatever you did. See, that's back in the day when we believed in whooping. <laughs> and I think we should get back to the days of whooping. But anyway. <laughs> So, Galatians. Go to Galatians 5. Look at verse 21. I'm going to preach on one word. It's the word do. Galatians 5, 21. He's listing all of these things of the flesh. So I guess we can't start in 21. Let's start in uh, verse 18. But if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. These are the things that the flesh likes. The flesh thinks every one of these is okay. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, which is pharmakia, which is probably better translated drug abuse, okay? Hatred, you know, your flesh thinks it's not your elbow, it's but the unrenewed part of your soul. It thinks it's okay to hate that guy. Variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, <gasps> envyings, murders, <laughs> drunkenness, revelings. Now notice, and such like, meaning that's not an all-exhaustive list. That's just a sample. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past. Now notice, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Isn't that a scary verse? Now, the word do, as always, in the Greek language, there's more than one word that can be translated do, okay? This one in Strong's is G4238. You spell it P-R-A-S-S-O, and I think it's pronounced presso, but I don't know. And it's a primary verb, and it means to practice, that is, perform repeatedly, or habitually. So it's different. See, there's another Greek word for do called uh, number G4160. You can do another study on that one. But it means to a single act. So when he says those people that do such things, he's not talking about a single act. He's talking about this is their lifestyle. This they do habitually. You got that? It's one thing. See, that's why in 1 John 1, 9, if we sin, we are to con... Yes, sir. He said, read it. Y'all turn to it. 1 John chapter 1. Because then he wants to go on over to chapter 2 also. And the purpose of, the, of John's letter is so that we would have fellowship with the Father and Jesus the same way that he has fellowship with the Father and with Jesus. So... Pick it up where Alan was, verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, has his son, cleanses us from all sin. See, years ago, that verse came alive in me because there, uh, there was a long time when I thought to walk in the light, as he is in the light, mean to walk perfect. Isn't that what it sounded like? If you, if you walk in the light, as he is in the light, well, how's he in the light? Well, he walks perfectly. So my thinking was, well, for me to walk in the light the same way he's in the light, I would have to walk perfectly. But that, it doesn't make sense with the rest of the verse because if I'm walking perfectly, I don't need to be cleansed from any sin. <laughs> Isn't that right? <laughs> That's a, so that, that couldn't be what he's talking about. And you have to go all the way back to John chapter 8 and when they brought in that woman caught in the act of adultery and they were going to stone her and they wanted Jesus to stone her. And he says, woman... 
you know, he, he wrote, in, wrote in the sand, and they each one left, and woman, where are thine accusers? And, and they're all gone, Lord, neither do I accuse thee. Go and sin no more, right? But in the very next breath, he said, those that follow me, they will not walk in darkness, for they shall have the light of life. Right there, he was already prophesying about the new birth. Living in adultery, when you call that walking in darkness. The woman was walking in darkness, but he's saying about her, look, he says, I'm going to pay the price for her. Her sins are going to be fully paid for by my own blood. But if she'll follow me into this new, new life, into the new birth, she and everyone else who follows me, you won't continue to walk in darkness like she's walking now. You will have the light of life. Amen? Well, that's the very new birth. That's the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That is what has made us free from sin. James calls it the law of liberty. It's not just free from the law. It's free from sin. But nobody that I know of goes from sinner to saint perfectly overnight. It's a growth process. Has been in my life, has been in everybody I've ever known. So what he's really talking about here is walk real close with that new nature. And this is why I love Nathan's teaching, although it's hard sometimes. Nathan has got a gift of black and white. There's no gray in Nathan. Have you seen that? <laughs> and it helps me, though. I need that knife edge sometimes, you know. But he says, look, if you learn to walk by that light, that is the new nature. That's that voice of the conscience that he put on the inside of you. And if you just learn to listen to that, and yield to that, then you will constantly walk in the light. And that's what we're all endeavoring to do. Am I in the right church? We're all endeavoring to do that, but I don't know anybody that's perfect at it. And so you sin or you, you, you know. Now, if you're purposely planning, hmm, this is what Dave, now Dave is very kind to us. As you know, how did the Holy Spirit say that? Dave's humor are the enzymes that help us digest the meat of the word. So Dave, he would get real funny about it. Oh, I thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus. I thank you, Lord. I'm so glad to be saved by the blood. Lord, I'm sure glad you forgave me for everything I did last weekend. But you're packing your Friday night bag, you know. And I'm going to be having fun with my friends tonight. And I'm packing this and I'm packing that in my bag. And you're about through and you're thanking the Lord for everything he's done. So, oh, I about forgot one thing. And that's where you go and you get your repentance pills. And you're packing them ahead of time because you're planning on sinning. Oh, but I've got my repentance pills. And Dave would say, that will not work. That's not what he's talking about. You are planning ahead on purpose. Now, there's forgiveness even for that. But that is a much more scary and dangerous walk than most Christians are walking. Most of us are trying to walk in the light as he is in the light. What I mean by that is listening to that nature. Like the, I go back to the guy at the quick trip again that was cussing me out and giving me the finger and I've got my, my granddaughter in the car and I don't like that, you know, even, even though that, you know, my first impulse, flesh impulse, animal impulse, I'm going to back over that guy. <laughs> now that's, that's slow to hear, <laughs> quick to speak and quick to wrath, <laughs> amen. But see, I had to listen. There's another voice. No, 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 you need to pray for him. You don't know what he's going through. Besides, he wasn't all wrong. I did almost hit him. <laughs> well, anyway. <laughs> you got to listen to that new nature, and we're all trying to do that. Amen? So this word where it says, those that do such things, it is so important you understand. The devil will beat you up if you don't measure up to your own standard of perfection. He'll always have you under condemnation, even though you may have slipped up once, but you're not a habitual whatever. You understand? <clears throat> go to, oh, did I go to 1 John? I did. See, if we confess our sins, okay, verse 7, walk in the light as he is in the light. Well, we're all trying to do that. Hopefully you're learning to listen to the new nature. Slow to, slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to wrath. Do whatever he tells you by the new nature. That's how you walk in the light. But if you miss it and you backed over the guy, <laughs> extreme. <laughs> if, you, if, you did, 
If you cussed him out, rolled down the window, got the knife. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, right there, if you did that and you say you have no sin, then you're deceiving yourself, aren't you? The truth's not in you. I didn't sin. Nope. I cussed him out, but I didn't. <laughs> I just bumped him a little bit. I didn't run him over, Lord. I just. <laughs> no, I didn't either. I'm just. <laughs> No, you got to fess up. Like any parent wants with their child. Just tell me, son. Don't lie to me about it. And if we confess our sins, see, you're walking close with him. Go back to my bourbon and coke days. Walk close with him. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. You know why he's just? That blood is still on the mercy seat. That blood is still there. To forgive us our sins. The forgiveness of sin belongs to the Christian. Remission of sin belongs to the sons of Adam. They were all paid for. Well, provision has been made to pay for every sin now. But it's as you walk real close with him. You confess your sin. And he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, and that's in that condition when you know you did, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now see, here's the standard. Look, my little children, these things write I unto you. Why? What's his purpose? There are actually people here. The purpose is that you sin not. See, that is the, that is the mark. But thank God, the rest of the verse is in there. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. I'm so glad I've got a lawyer. When I sin, I've got a lawyer I can turn to. He's my elder brother. And the other good news, the, father, the judge is my father. <laughs> that doesn't mean... <laughs> But Jesus still is the propitiation for our sins. That blood is still on the mercy seat. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. I want to read you a little passage. I'm not big on commentaries, but uh, Albert Barnes was a guy that lived over 100 years ago. Greek scholar. Uh, I don't really recommend, you know, don't go buy the books and stuff. But he did a really good job on this one. And it's because of that word... We'll get into it more. I can see what the Spirit's doing in this season. Uh, we'll probably get into more of 1 John. Alan may teach it or I may teach it. But, um, every time you read here in 1 John where it talks about it, he, he that's born of God sinneth not, it's always in that same Greek tense. Habitually sinneth not. That's not your lifestyle anymore. You may stumble, you may trip, you may, you may sin. But it's not normal for you. And if your conscience is alive, which it should be, you're going to get condemned right away, convicted. And that's when you run to the blood. And that's how you stay in fellowship, to shorten the whole book. Okay? All right? But listen to what he says here. Uh, look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Boy, isn't that... <laughs> Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him and neither known him. Now, <clears throat> this passage does teach about a true Christian. And the fair and proper meaning from the Greek words may be summed up in the following. He who is born again does not sin habitually. The Greek language bears that out. He is not a habitual sinner. If he does wrong, it is when he is overtaken by temptation and the act is against the habitual inclination and purpose of his soul. But now if a person does sin habitually, habitually, if Gary was still like he was before he got saved 30 years later, and I'm still the same old, same old, What's that proof of? I didn't get saved. 
I didn't get saved. If I'm still habitually that same guy that I was then, I didn't get saved. Okay? He who is born again does not do wrong deliberately and by design. Now, that's what Dave meant by don't pack your pre-repentance pills. You get that? He means to do right. He is not willfully and deliberately sinning. If a man deliberately and intentionally does wrong, he shows that he is not actually actuated by the Spirit of Christ. It is true that when one does wrong or commits sin, there is a momentary assent of the will. I'm glad he put that in there. You know what that tells me? What is, how does Dave put it? When you sin, did you have to? No, you chose to. But it may have been a momentary lapse. The way he put it was a momentary assent, agreement of the will. But it is under the influence of passion or excitement or temptation or provocation and not as the result of a deliberate plan or purpose of the soul. A man who deliberately and intentionally does wrong shows that he is not a true Christian. And if this were all that is understood by perfection, then there would not then there would be many who are perfect, for there are many, many Christians who can't recollect an instance for many years in which they have intentionally and deliberately done a wrong thing. You want to walk close to the new nature. Walk close to the new nature. Do not yield to the flesh. And this is a good season of fasting to do that. I'll stop there. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. We're going to go ahead and start the confessions now. And I know not everybody can stay for the confessions. Now there is no condemnation. Nowhere have I found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, thou shalt stay for Sunday night confessions. So, anyway. Praise the Lord. Y'all are quiet tonight. Am I, what? Be glad when I get past fasting season. I will too. Father, we worship you. We glorify you. We praise you. You're not a man that you could lie. You have exalted your word above your name. Heaven and earth will pass away. But your word will never pass away. Therefore I say. Your glory is present at the prayer center. The blind see. The deaf hear, the lame walk, the dead are raised, and the poor, they have the gospel preached to them. A minimum of a thousand people are born again at the prayer center every week. We have a minimum of 500 intercessors who are holding up the message that has come to maturity. We are able to get along with each other while the Father works revival in our midst. We have that kind of worship that takes us beyond the veil of the flesh in order that we may worship in spirit and in truth. We worship you, Father, out of our new nature. And we give you family worship as your sons and daughters. Father at the prayer center. Those that come will see a people. Transformed to the nature of Christ. Father we say. In the name of Jesus. No person ever leaves the prayer center the same way they came. Every person that comes receives a touch from the Good Shepherd. Father, those that come who are beaten down, discouraged, worn out, and tired, they won't leave that way. They'll be encouraged, strong, and mature. They'll leave standing upright, their shoulders squared. Their heads held high, going forth as a mighty army to take this planet for your kingdom. In the name of Jesus. 
I was laughing because I thought of a title for tonight's message, but I'm not going to use it. It's called Kill the Whiny Baby. <laughs> or Mortify the Whiny Baby, maybe. <laughs> you think I ought to use that? I don't know. We'll see. Father, your glory fills every service. <laughs> every person that comes drinks of your glory. They'll leave as earthen vessels filled with your glory, filled with your wisdom, filled with your love, filled with your grace, and anointed by your spirit. I may use it. The more I think about it. Anyway, they'll carry your presence with them, and they'll carry revival around this world. Father, we declare... We preach your gospel. We'll never settle for man's gospel. Only yours. It's the gospel that saves. The gospel that fills. And the gospel that heals. That's why we say. Lost. Be saved. Empty. Be filled. Blind. See. Lame. Walk. Deaf, hear. Maimed, behold. Dead, rise again. In the name of Jesus. Father, that's your gospel. We'll settle for nothing less. We're going for the gold. We have what we say. And we say, at every service, the lost are saved. People are filled with the Holy Ghost. The blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, the maimed are made whole, and even the dead are raised in the name of Jesus. More than 12 legions of angels are loosed to prepare the way for revival. Angels are dispatched to the four corners of the earth. Intercepting and stopping every mission and every assignment of the enemy that would bring circumstances against those who would come. Angels are changing those circumstances by rearranging them, causing money to come, and by changing schedules. We say every person that is to be here We'll be here in the name of Jesus. There is no devil big enough, no assignment crafty enough, no circumstances bad enough that will keep even one from being here. Father, we declare your house full. Angels are moving back. The forces of darkness over this region. They're opening up a window, a window of light, 25 miles in every direction, both horizontally and vertically. There is a fortress of angels surrounding us to keep back the darkness. Father, angels are dispatched now, softening the hearts where hurts have wounded, where calluses have formed, where walls of defenses have gone up. Angels are softening the hearts and creating atmospheres where the people can hear the voice of their shepherd. Angels are preparing their hearts now. So they're already receivers when they arrive. From the first word spoken, from the first song sung, from the first prayer prayed, to the end of every service, the people are free to receive from your spirit. The assignments of all devils against the prayer center, the people of the prayer center, and the leadership of the prayer center... All those assignments are dismissed in the name of Jesus. 
And I declare those plans null and void. Devil, we're taking Tulsa from you. In fact, we already have. Jesus is Lord over Tulsa. Not you. We're in authority here. Not you. Devil, get out of Tulsa. Take all your demons with you. The King of Kings has made a decree. And I am speaking in his stead. The King has declared. This is the acceptable year of the Lord. The King has decreed. Captives, you are free. Every person returns to his original inheritance. That is the born again trail. Father, you have restored our inheritance. And at the prayer center, the inheritance is not just known about. We don't just teach about it, but it's received, manifested, and seen. Father, you have restored our fellowship with you. The firstborn told us to pray. Father, your will be done on earth, just as it is in heaven. As in heaven, so on earth. As in heaven, so in Tulsa. There are no lost people in heaven. Therefore, we say, Tulsa is saved. There are no sick people in heaven. Therefore, we say, Tulsa is healed. There are no demoniacs in heaven. Therefore, we say, Tulsa is delivered. And there's no poor people in heaven. Therefore, we say, Tulsa is prospered. And Tulsa is blessed. We declare every captive free, every wheelchair emptied, all of them, no exceptions, every artificial help, wheelchairs, crutches, canes, hearing aids, glasses, stretchers, bladder bottles, they may need them when they come, they won't need them when they leave. And we'll have them here as trophies to the glory of Jesus, the healer. All manner of sickness and all manner of diseases are healed first time, every time, all of them, no exceptions. Jesus, you healed them all then. You healed them all now. That's what we say. That's what we have in the name of Jesus. Father, there are impartations of your spirit. We declare these are the most powerful, the most anointed, the most life-changing, the most revival-producing services in history. Fresh anointings, fresh giftings, like never before since the book of Acts. Father, it's you doing the works. Therefore, all things are possible. So, my own soul, I command you, believe this, all things are possible. All things are possible. All things are possible. And every backslider will come back to God. They will never leave God again. So now, Father, in preparation, I forgive every person their trespasses against me. Father, forgive me all of my trespasses against you. I am freshly washed in the blood of the Lamb. In order that my record in heaven be perfect. And that means if you have to go 70 times 7 a day. You hear me? Therefore I say. 
because of the blood. What Jesus did for me. Seventy times seven today. <laughs> According to my record in heaven, I have never failed God. I lay down my life that the life of Christ may be manifest in me. I take no offense. I give no offense. And according to my record in heaven, I never have. At the prayer center, the mind of Christ is delivered to both the sheep and the shepherds. It's delivered with such simplicity and with such clarity that the wayfaring fool could not misunderstand it. Therefore I say, the people at the prayer center, and especially me, we all understand every word that Pastor Dave teaches. And we declare that Pastor Dave teaches. <laughs> every need is met, no matter how large, no matter how small, there are no cases too hard. There are no cases too late. Whatever they come for to receive from Jesus, they get it, all of them, first time, every time, no exceptions. I declare every captive free. Free in spirit, free in soul, free in body. All are delivered. All are restored. Father, you are provider. Angels are dispatched to gather in all of the finances and everything that is required. Things we know about now, things we don't even know about yet, because you are the God who answers before we call. I speak against the strongholds of lack. And I declare an abundance. Abundance. Be in the name of Jesus. Therefore we say. There is no lack. We operate from abundance. We operate from surplus. We have all in abound with many baskets left over. We have such abundance. We can pay the way for many to come. And many to go. And we send them out on prosperous journeys for God with abundance. In a manner fitting for servants of the Lord. Our financial granaries are full. Because our king has found stewards he can trust. And I'm one of them. Father, if you need anything. Come to my house first. Whatever you have need of, come to my house first. All I need to know is my Lord has need of it, and it's yours. I've been bought with a price. My life is not my own. I am a first-class servant. Lord, I lay all my possessions at your feet. And I say again, Lord, if you need anything I have, it's yours. I love you, Lord, with all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my mind, and all of my strength. The second commandment is like unto the first. I love my neighbor as myself. I love my good neighbors. I love my bad neighbors. I love my mean neighbors. And I love my enemies. I love the guy at the quick trip. Right. <laughs> Jesus, you are my Savior. You are my Lord. Whatever you ask, that's what I do. I am your servant. I am your bond slave. By my own free will choice. And I serve you, Lord. By serving these people that you love so much. 
I serve the good people. I serve the bad people. I serve the mean people. And I especially serve your enemies. Because you're trying to save them all. You'd like to use me to do it. All that I have is yours. My time is yours. My body is yours. My family is yours. I own nothing. I am your bond slave. Use me as you will. You are provider for me, my family, and all that I have. And I am available for your use. We lift up the blood-stained banner over this city. Written in the blood of Jesus on the banner are these words. Jesus is Lord over Tulsa. Jesus is Lord over Tulsa. Tulsa is in revival. Tulsa is in revival. Where Jesus is Lord, the Father's will is done. Father, have your way. Not just 30-fold. Not just 60-fold. But 100-fold. Again, I say, lost, be saved. Empty, be filled. Captives, go free. Blind, see. Deaf, hear. Lame, walk. Maimed, be whole. Dead, rise again. In the name of Jesus. Father, thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power. Thine is the glory. Forever, your will be done in Tulsa, just as it is in heaven. As in heaven, so in earth. As in heaven, so in Tulsa. Tulsa is saved. Tulsa is saved. Tulsa is saved. Now shout about it. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah, Lord. We have what we say, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We have what we say. Hallelujah. Father, we're looking at these pictures and these faces again. Lord, every one of these represents an impossible case. According to the world, they have no answers at all. But, Father, there's no such thing as that with you. All things are possible with God. Father, we're not praying for these again tonight because we know you heard us the first time we prayed. Our job is to believe we received when we prayed, and we will see the manifestation of this miracle in every single case. Father, for the prayer requests inside of this box, there's everything from the simple to the difficult, everything from hangnails to suicide and everything in between. Father, your word tells us that if we ask anything that's according to your will, we know that you hear us. And our confidence is if you hear us, then we have the petitions that we desire of you. Father, we're just joining our faith together with these and thanking you for answering every single prayer that Jesus paid the price for them to have. And Father, if someone sent in a prayer request that's not a, they're not in the family yet, they're what the Bible would call a stranger, they're not born again, not in the family. Lord, if they ha- we don't care if they're Hindu, Muslim, atheist, agnostic, doesn't matter. Lord, if they had enough faith to send a prayer request here, and if that request is in line with your will, Father, we ask like Solomon asked, answer the prayer of the stranger. Father, do it in such an unusual and unique way. They'll have to know it was you that answered that prayer. So they can know, like we already know, that you are the only true and living God. They can hear the gospel of your son and be saved in Jesus' name. Father, we pray over every prayer cloth that goes forward from this place. You have not changed at all. You're the same God today that you were in the book of Acts. Father, when those napkins that left Paul's bodies was laid on the sick, they recovered. Devils came out. and Father, we expect the same. When these prayer claws are laid on the sick, they will recover every single time. Father, devils will come out. That means alcoholics will be delivered. Drug addicts will be delivered. Bipolar people will be set free. Schizophrenia will be, 
people be delivered. And many other such things you do because you're the same today that you were then. Father, we lift up Pastor Dave and Rosalie to you, Lord, and all of their house. Tim and Leah Stemple, all of their house. All of the ministers and their families here and around the world. The staff and all the congregations, Lord. Father, we declare no weapon formed against any of them will prosper. But everything they set their hand to do will prosper. Yes, sir, I hear that. Father, we lift up the President of the United States to you. Not just him, Lord, but all of the leaders that have been elected to public office, whether it be on the national, state, or local level, Father. Father, we pray that righteousness reigns in this land. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Father, let righteousness reign like, let it pour down like rain from heaven upon this land again. Give our leaders wisdom and strength and courage to stand up and do what is right, even in the face of a perverse generation, Lord. Father, return righteousness to this land. We pray that we may lead a godly and peaceable life in Christ Jesus. Mm. Father, we're faced with another week now. We had the same number of hours available to us as the president or any king. Father, if anything, the hours we have might be more important because our hours have to do with eternal things, not just temporary things. Father, it's real easy for another week to go by. Be so busy we never gave time to what you've told us to give time to. Help us be good stewards, Lord. One day we're going to stand before you and give an accounting of how we stewarded the life you gave us. We sure want to have the same testimony Paul had. We fought the good fight. And we kept the faith. And we finished the race that you set in front of us. Father, we know what that race is for us. It is a manifested revival in the earth. And Father, Father you will have your revival. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody says, amen, amen.